I'm Jay Rachel Edgerton. And I'm Miles Stokes. And we're the hosts of Jay and Miles Explain the X-Men, a weekly podcast all about the ins, the outs, and the retcons of comics' greatest superhero soap opera. We're also the hosts of Jay and Miles Review the X-Men. Which you're watching right now. Where we talk about the X-Books that come out each week. This week we're looking at the books of October 26th and November 2nd, 2016. Let's go. We'll start with last week's book, Extraordinary X-Men, number 15. Written by Jeff Lemire, with art by Victor Ibanez, layouts by Guillermo Mogaran, and colors by J. David Ramos. So, we are past Apocalypse Wars at this point, point. we're just sort of in, you know, storyline stuff. And I feel good about that, because so much of my favorite X-Men from the 70s and 80s wasn't just one defined story, like the Dark Phoenix Saga, or Days of Future Past, or whatever. It was just continuing storyline stuff. Not no. that Apocalypse isn't still around as a major player right now. Oh, totally, yeah. I'm actually enjoying how he's being handled, because he's currently imprisoned by the X-Men, specifically by Forge and some, you know, machinery made of science, uh, in the hopes of Apocalypse somehow curing Colossus of being a horseman of Apocalypse, uh, since now he's all doomy and gloomy and his hair is gone and that's sad. Well, and also because they captured him and they're trying to, you know, keep him off the streets, as it were. Right, right. You know, of, of the future alternate universes. Keep the kids and the Colossuses and the Apocalypses off the streets. Um, but yeah, the way that Apocalypse is totally lecturing Forge is really, really working for me. Specifically, okay, so comics are a serial, serial medium, right? Like, you'll have different chapters in the form of issues, and so the passage of time is very carefully paced in these bite-sized chunks. And so getting to see Forge being super like, you're not going to mess with me, dude, last issue and cover Apocalypse's mouth with duct tape, which was pretty hilarious, and seeing Forge start to crack under the strain of Apocalypse's continual sort of needling, that really works for me. I like where that's going. I gotta say, the storyline here that's pulling me in the most is the one surrounding magic. I, I completely agree, yeah. So the Sapna stuff. Yeah, because magic's protege, Sapna, is, you know, possessed slash consumed slash whatever by this being called the World Eater, which is pretty awesome. And so seeing Ilyana and Storm, you know, once again, sorceress pals, just like in the, the Storm and Ilyana miniseries way back in the day, seeing them go across dimensions try to, trying to figure out what's going on, seeing Ilyana just break a little bit, seeing her cry as she realizes that her this little girl who's depending on her could be doing, going down the same dark path that she was forced to, that works. That's bringing in the history of the character, and it's being handled well now, I think. I mean, Lemire hasn't always been perfect with characters' voices, but this is an area where I think he really shines. Yeah, we've seen a lot of Ilyana as sort of a supporting character, one who was there mostly in the wings of other people's significant stories and moments in, mm -hmm. honestly, the last several runs that she's been in, really mostly since her return. I would agree, yeah. I think this is becoming, yeah. for me, the definitive Ilyana. And also visually, uh, man, Victor Ibanez's Ilyana Rasputin, mm -hmm. I think he's my favorite artist for her since Brett Blevins way, way, way back in the day. Wow. Like she actually, Well, she actually seems like a distinctive character visually again. Yeah, she does. And it's so easy for her just to be like the attractive mean lady. And now she's... Well, and that's that's especially a problem when she's on a team with Emma Frost, who kind of has that role so <gasps> Right, kind of exactly. Down. So Ilyana, Ilyana was the attractive mean lady with bangs. And I think she, she grew. Banks. She, well, she did. Now she grew them out. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so that's working for me as well. But I think my favorite part of this issue, again, going with the this is just story stuff happening, is back at the school when the younger X Men, you know, the former students, come back, seeing Glob Herman awkwardly flirt with young Jean Grey and Anil trying way too hard to be a wingman and talk Glob up. That's what I miss. Oh. I miss having like you know, darkness and drama and horribleness, but also just fun. Also, the characters just enjoying each other's company and being awkward and entertaining. Like, Extraordinary X-Men, it took it so long to get here, but I gotta say, for me, this is turning into the book that I always wanted it to be. This is turning into a book I feel pretty okay about being the flagship X-Book. Next up from this week, we have Death of X number three, written by Charles Soule and Jeff Lemire, pencils by Aaron Cooter and Javier... Garone, inks by Jay Liston and Javier Garone, and colors by Morty Hollowell, Jason Keith, Will Quintana, Matt Miller, and Andrew Crossley. Wow, this sure is a semi-monthly title. I think I actually did some coloring as well. There's a, a corner of a panel. That was that was me. I the mark the, the markers don't count, man. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I haven't seen a creative team that big in quite a while. It's I mean this is this is again something that tends to happen on semi-monthly titles. You get something that's rushed. You got to bring people in to finish it. You got to keep the book on schedule. Mm -hmm. And um, planned or not, it's a book that, despite the size of that that creative team, is very visually cohesive. Um, yeah, yeah. That I, is, I would not have guessed if I hadn't seen the credits page that that many people were involved. Mm -hmm. So well coordinated Marvel editorial, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is this is continuing the storyline, and I I'm not sure how much I can talk about in here without spoilers. 
Well, I mean, we already talked about our theory as to what was going on last time. Which this definitely reinforces. I think it does. I think you may be right about that yeah, based on I the way. Yeah, I have strong suspicions. Um, this also brings back a character who I don't think we've seen since the late 80s. Right? Freaking, freaking Tom, Alchemy. Thomas Jones. Alchemy. Um, Alchemy was a character who was the result of a fan contest, a mutant registration contest, where you made up mutants, sent them in, and they, they used this one in a brief X-Factor story drawn by Art Adams. Um, oh. It's a really fun story. It's got trolls, the, the old with, with cudgels and stuff kind, not, not the internet kind. Right. Um, it's, it's delightful. I mentioned that it's drawn by Art Adams, but I'm going to say it again because the art's just that good. And one thing I really enjoyed about the artistic team in this book is that mm-hmm. they capture Art Adams' style for drawing alchemy. Like, he's got this kind of large, pointy nose. He's lanky in a very specific way. And this is very clearly the same character, which is a hard thing to do when you have a guy who's just sort of a guy. Like, he doesn't have a super costume or anything like that. Yeah, he's recognizable after this long, which is really, really impressive. As for the story, um... Man, I hope four pulls it together. Because yeah. Because it's feeling a little bit anticlimactic. I've got some ideas as to where it could be going. I've got some ideas as to what the twist could be if there's going to be a major twist. I don't know. It could be that everything is just a lot of red herrings, um, which would be kind of its own awesome Like literally thing. fish, just red fish. They that's were what responsible. Alchemy's going to turn the Terrigen Cloud into? Uh, no, that's actually what Cyclops did. Is he did his optic blast, but it was just fish instead. It was really gross and it smelled terrible after like a day. I, I, you heard it here first. I like the um, I, I I like Max's theory from Waiting for the Trade that he he accidentally tripped and uh, kicked a puppy into the machine that melted all of the ice cream in the world. <laughs> Why would you even make that? Why would you make that? It's All true. Right. It's like um, in the second Spider-Man movie how Dr. Octopus had the yes, be evil, no, don't be evil chip on the back exactly. of his neck. Exactly. That's my favorite plot point from it. Yeah, but it's interesting. I'm intrigued to see where it's going. The art is so strong. The art mm-hmm. is, I mean, the writing is good in here, but the art is what I'm coming back to this for, and it's what's really taking my breath away in this book. I really liked some of the panel design as well. Like, there are some pages where the panels, like, just don't look right mm-hmm. in a way that really sells the tone that that scene is going for. Yeah, Kuder and Goron are doing a terrific, terrific job on this. And again, whether or not this is a plot line you're invested in, this is a series that it's worth at least looking at for the visuals, because they're beautiful. So normally we don't review non-X books, even when they've got X characters in them. But um, I'm going to make an exception this week, possibly occasionally in the future. Um, We'll see. Because Champions number two... Um, introduces Cyclops to the team. Young Specifically, Cyclops. Young, well, he's the only one who's alive to join the team. That's right. Um, and it's delightful. This is written by Mark Wade. It's drawn by Umberto Ramos with inks by Victor Olazaba and colors by Edgar Delgado. And it's lovely. It's a smart, funny, interesting, compassionate, clever teenage book. And I really like the way Cyclops is being written and drawn in it. I like this team. I like this dynamic. And I'm really excited about it going forward. So I guess not much of a review, but yeah, worth picking up. I still haven't read it yet, but now I'm even more excited. You should. You will adore it. I'm going to read it when we get home. Okay. Okay. So those are our two and a half comics for two weeks. Jay, what's our pick? Well, they're both good comics. All three of them are good comics. But ultimately, I feel like um, our pick this week has to be the Cubs winning the World Series for the first time in 108 years. Oh, man, I don't remember what it I was, was doing It was so then. awesome. It went into extra innings. Um, there was rain. It was amazing and epic and fantastic, and I'm really excited. I, I, I like amazing epic things, but does this, what does this have to do with X-Men? Um, Kitty Pride is canonically a Cubs fan. Well, that's true. She is, isn't she? It's relevant. And baseball. The X-Men do play baseball. Yes. Well, there you have I it. I stand by it. Okay. I have a hat. Okay, so um, what's our panel of the week? Our panel of the week is not from the Cubs game. Do they have panels? I don't know how baseball they have works. Plays. Well, well, it's not that. Uh, instead, it is from Death of X number three, and I think it's just a particularly good panel of Emma Frost. So Emma Frost is normally the most put together person in the entire room. That's kind of her deal. I mean, she's arguably the most put together person in the Marvel universe. Probably, although I suspect at least some of that is uh, telepathic augmentation. You know, she so? just makes herself look that way to you. That still counts as put together. I think it does. Yeah, uh, but the way she's drawn here, no, obviously, you know, her hair's in her face, and that doesn't normally happen. It's a little tangled up in places. It's you know, out of place. 
But the way her face is drawn right here, if you look at her lips, the uh, the coloring team, whichever one worked on this panel, did a really good job by not having it be quite symmetrical, by having, I don't know if it's her lipstick smudged or if her mouth is just particularly uh, not lined up right because she's so distracted. Let me see. Some of that is reflection, but... Mm -hmm. But this is a character Shame. who's largely defined by looking exactly perfect, the fact that she doesn't, and that the fact that she doesn't is sold so well as to not be a deliberate choice, I think that's an effective panel. Yeah, it's that it's not that she doesn't look put together, it's that she doesn't look poised. That's a better way of putting it, I think you're absolutely right, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yes, well done, very large art team. We love you all equally. All right, that is all we have for this week. Um, before we go, though, got two announcements. The first is, is more of a reminder. Actually, they're both reminders. Mm -hmm. um, the first is that we are going to be at Vegas Valley Comic Book Fest this weekend. It's at the Clark County Library on Saturday, November 5th. It's a free show. We're going to be doing a live episode. Uh, we'll be tabling. Uh, we've got panels all day. Come see us. Come say hi. Um, we will have zines and buttons and t-shirts and all the usual stuff we have on our table. And we totally give excellent high fives. We totally do. Uh, the second thing, also being a reminder, uh, if you are an American viewer slash listener, uh, please vote. Tuesday's the election. This is a really, really mm -hmm. important one, and I assure you your vote really does matter. So I know it can be sort of a pain to get to the polls or to vote early, however that works in your state or, or doesn't work, but um, please vote. We would love you forever. I mean, we're going to love you forever regardless, but we'd like love you forever a little bit more. Also, despite the announcements that you may have been seeing on Twitter and other social media, you cannot vote by text message. That's not real. Wait, people have been saying that's a thing? Yeah, people have been saying that's a thing. Oh. I mean, you can text each other about other stuff, but yes, apparently yeah, not no, that. You, you, cannot, you cannot actually vote by text message. And if you're in Oregon, today was the last day to mail your ballot, but you can still drop them off through the 8th or vote live at any of the ballot drop-off sites, which you can find on the Board of Elections website. Indeed. But uh, meanwhile, outro stuff. Right. Um, if you like what you've seen here but think it would be way better without our faces, check out our podcast, Jay and Miles Explain the X-Men. New episodes go up every Sunday at explainthexmen.com, also on iTunes and Stitcher. What have we got for them this week? This week we have part two of X-Factor's Judgment War storyline, with all the space opera-y goodness you came to ex uh, expect from part one, but like also a lot of giant robots and channeling the power of love through Cyclops' face into a big bird to blow off a guy's thumb. There's a lot happening in this story. It's a lot of fun. Check it out. That podcast, these video reviews, and everything at explainthexmen.com come to you via our Patreon subscribers. We are an entirely listener-supported project. Those are the folks who let us stay on the air and ad-free. And if you want to join their ranks, which you totally should, you can do that at the link either above or below this video, depending on where you're watching it. Indeed. In the meantime, we will hopefully see some of you in Las Vegas this weekend. And we'll see the rest of you on YouTube very soon after that. Project that I hope you can help with